Hi there, my name's Dan. I'm the Training Minister of Grace Church Hayward Teeth. It's great to have you with us. This is the longest sermon that we put out every week, looking at the passage that we've explored in our um, main service. Uh, We're in Luke chapter 9, but we're going to start off with our Old Testament reading, which is in the book of Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 52, verses 13 to the end of chapter 53. So I'll just give you a moment to turn that up and I'll read it out. Starting at verse 13 of chapter 52. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. It's a great Old Testament passage that is going to help us understand what's going on in Luke chapter 9. Starting at verse 18, is where I um, turn back to that. And you might remember a couple of weeks ago in our service, if you were with us, I referred back to a Guardian article that showed that people are turning to faith during the middle of coronavirus. Vast numbers are checking out online religious services, engaging more in spirituality. That's really encouraging to see, as kind of general agnosticism is shown to be an untenable position and secularism is shown to be so just unsatisfying when suffering comes along. But we do have to be careful with this news as well, because whilst there might be a turn back to spirituality, that can be quite vague. And the breakdown of which religions people are turning to or what stripe of each religion that is, that's not clear either. What we want people to be crystal clear on at the moment is what does it mean to be a Christian? You see, there's a lot of confusion with that today, particularly in the UK, with our tradition of people going to church. Many of us would have experienced it, people saying, I'm a Christian. And by that they mean, you know, they went to church as a child, or they've been baptised or confirmed, or they kind of loosely hold to some kind of Christian ethic. It is enormously important to be crystal clear on what 
being a Christian is. We don't want vagueness. We don't want people swimming around in their own ideas, either outside the church or even in it. You know, people can run after spirituality, but if they're not running in the right direction, well, it's not going to do them any kind of substantial good. Which is why in our New Testament reading, as we let Jesus define what being a Christian is, his identity, his mission, our appropriate response, we find really clear, a, a clear foundational instructions that are going to help all of us in understanding what it means to be a Christian. See, it's Jesus' identity and Jesus' mission which define what it means to be a Christian. Jesus' mission and identity define what it means to live as a Christian. As first principles, we're going to start with Jesus and work from there. For those of us who aren't Christians who are watching this, I hope that this is really clear and helpful for you. There is nothing more important than getting clear on who Jesus is and why he came. But if you're, if you're a regular member of a church, if you would call yourself a Christian, well this week I found it immensely helpful preparing this passage, seeing the, the clarity of Jesus' call of who he is. It's never a bad thing to go back and examine our foundations. It's been incredibly helpful for me. I hope it's helpful for you too. I confess it's almost impossible for me to do justice to the depth and weight of these words. But I pray that God might use this to help you live as a Christian in the coming week. But let, let's dive in. And the first thing we're going to see is we must be crystal clear on Jesus' identity. We must be crystal clear on Jesus' identity. Finally, Jesus and the disciples had the privacy they wanted from earlier on in the chapter. And Jesus, as he so often does in Luke's gospel, uses it to pray just before something substantial happens. It's a bit of a tip off that what happens here is vitally important. We're going to get to the heart of who Jesus is. He asks his disciples, who do the crowds say I am? In verse 20, who do you say? I am. Who is Jesus? It's vitally important we get someone's identity, isn't it? Because their identity is intrinsically linked to what it is they do. See, a doctor is known as a healer. A policeman is a keeper of the law. Once you know who, who they are, you know what they do. When you see the uniform, you, you, know, you respond appropriately. A stethoscope makes you feel relaxed. Someone can help. A bobby's hat makes you feel kind of, you straighten up a little bit and you start, which laws do I need to follow at this time? Getting to the heart of Jesus' identity is even more vital. See, people have different ideas here. John the Baptist, Elijah come back to life. Those two are very closely connected in their minds, in the minds of people at the time from Malachi 4. John the Baptist was going to be this messenger, the new Elijah, who's going to bring people to God. Maybe that was Jesus. Or maybe he's a prophet, you know, one of the prophets of old, resurrected. Perhaps like Elisha, who did miracles, or like Moses. And these multiple views show disagreement. They show a lack of clarity. And because there's a lack of clarity, people don't know how to respond how can the crowds be so unclear? I mean, they've seen the miracles of Jesus, but they've only seen snippets. They haven't got the full picture. Maybe they've heard the teaching, but they haven't been with him. Just as a small little sidebar, for those of us who have friends who say they would believe in Jesus if only they saw a miracle, well, the crowd saw miracles. They've just seen him feed 5,000 people. Back in verses 7 and 8, those people have seen him perform many miracles as well. And yet there's no agreement on who Jesus is. Which is why Jesus drives the question home for his disciples who have been with him. 
Who do you say I am? They haven't got it right in the past, but look down. Peter says, God's Messiah, the Christ. And Jesus confirms this implicitly by silencing them. The Messiah isn't a surname, as many of us I'm sure we know. It's more like a title, like Sir or Lord. It means God's anointed one. In the Old Testament, only a prophet, a priest or a king were anointed. All three of those roles apply to Jesus. This is his identity, the anointed one of God, the one for whom there was expectation that everything would be sorted in God's world through him, that God was going to restore the creation through his Messiah. This was Jesus. This is who he is. It's just really clear. Jesus is God's Messiah. But that obviously creates expectation. When, um, when I do summer camps, um, very often during the week, we will spend an afternoon as a good leaders team and we'll go into the nearby town and we'll dress up in ridiculous costumes and the young people have to come around and find us, give us a password, play some kind of, um, kind of find the leader type game. It's a lot of fun. People dress up in really ridiculous things. One person shaved their head and decided to start busking on the side of the road. One person set up a, um, a charity in the middle of the park, said, save the endangered narwhal, and started braiding people's hair. Someone dressed up in neon uh, kind of spandex and started running an exercise class in the middle of the town square. But what these people have to be really careful of is not to take any money. You know, they've given an, an expectation, they've given an impression of themselves, but they, you know, the expectation is that people will want to give them money. But that's not who they are. Likewise, when we go into the town as leaders, we're very careful not to dress up as policemen or doctors or members of the army. You can imagine if there was an emergency and someone saw me dressed up as a policeman, but I'm a church minister, and said, I've just seen someone shoplifting. You have to go and sort them out. Of course, I'm the wrong man. So the uniform, the title... The impression gives certain expectations. And when those expectations aren't met, there's a, there's a real risk of disappointment. And in the case of um, a, a policeman or even a doctor, catastrophe. For Jesus, his identity, he's God's Messiah, vindicated by the miracles. That is clear. But many of us will have odd ideas differing ideas, confused ideas even, about what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah, the expectations we have, well, they might be all over the place. And it's important that we get Jesus' words on his, on his mission, what his identity means, so that our expectations aren't left disappointed. We have to let Jesus define his mission and in verse 22 he is brutally blunt he said the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life that's just right down the line isn't it Maybe you thought it was odd in verse 21 why Jesus silences his disciples. Well, it's because he wants them to have their expectations right before they start telling people about him. And he sets their expectations right. But if Jesus is this great conquering, earth-changing king, the Messiah, well, what he's just told us is so counterintuitive. Jesus defines the message, of, of the mission of the Messiah in that it is necessary that the Messiah must be rejected. He must die. He must be raised to life. That word must is really striking. 
all of our expectations about what God's king might look like, Jesus says, actually, no, the only way it could be is rejection and death. Why must this be the case? Well, our Old Testament reading from Isaiah helps us get to the bottom of it. You see, Jesus here takes up the role of this servant from Isaiah. And while everyone else is thinking glory and conquering, Jesus says, instead links himself and says, it's the Lord's will to crush him. And the Lord makes his life an offering for sin. In order to see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. See, Jesus comes according to God's will in order to be crushed, to make an offering for sin, an offering of his very life to pay the price for sins that his offspring, those who follow Jesus, might be seen. How does Jesus make this offering? He gives his life at the cross. He takes up and bears our sins upon his own shoulders, bearing to the punishment for them in his own body from verse 5. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. See, Jesus must die because this is the will of God that we, as people in desperate need of healing, might be healed of the sickness of our sin. That the wounds of sin in our life, the marks of being an enemy of God may be healed and we may be forgiven and restored to the God who made us. That is why Jesus must die. Any Christianity without a cross is not the kind of Christianity that Jesus understands. This is his mission that by the will of God he goes to the cross to die. Jesus' identity and mission for Christians even today constitute the heart of the Christian faith. It's all about Jesus the King. He is what occupies the central point of our faith. But not just his kingship, but his crucifixion and death in our place. Our only hope as Christians is that the Son of God may die for us. If this wasn't the case, God would not have sent him. It is the God's will that Jesus comes. This means that God's diagnosis of us as those who need saving by payment of death must be true and must be swallowed as the hard medicine that it is. It means that Jesus must be trusted, that we reach out and cry out to him, you are my only hope. It means that Jesus as the king and our saviour demands allegiance. As he calls us to follow him, as we'll think about in a moment, his identity and mission puts such a pull upon our lives that we must follow if we understand this. God will not save the world through anyone else other than Jesus. Jesus' identity as the Messiah and his mission to die on the cross are at the heart of the Christian faith. Being crystal clear on who he is and why he came. We move on to our our third point, you know, we must get what it means to be a Christian. When we get the identity and mission of Jesus right, well, we will know what it means to walk the same path as him. That's why we've trawled over the foundation so much. Because look down at verse 23. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. The ESV puts it quite nicely. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. 
when we get Jesus' identity as the king, but also his mission to die, we will see what it means to follow him. And it looks like self-denial. It looks like the cross-centred, cross-shaped life. If we want to sum it up, Jesus' mission shows that following Jesus for ourselves will mean not living for ourselves. Jesus gave up even his life for the forgiveness of the world. And so he calls his people to live the same kinds of lives of self-denial, even unto death. That's what Jesus means when he says taking up our cross. See, Jesus calls us to the path of the cross. We might ask why denying ourselves is so vitally important, particularly because in our society, everything seems to be geared towards gratifying ourselves. Well, the logic seems to be that there is something about living only for the self, which is at its root opposed to the kind of God that we serve. After all, Jesus comes according to the Father's will and lays down his life. See, this shows that God works by, well, not by self-service, but by self-sacrifice. I guess that means that living to save our own lives doesn't really fit with following Jesus, does it? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. If Jesus gave his life in service and yet his followers cling tightly to their own lives, well, something doesn't quite add up. Instead, those who follow the king will live lives of self-denial and self-sacrifice because that is the nature of the love of God. That is the nature of what Jesus has done for them. That means you get it. seems very counterintuitive doesn't it we don't get ahead in any other area of life like this the old adverts nike said just do it and l'oreal said because you're worth it those are a bit old but even the latest tech now you know amazon prime you can get what you want as quickly as possible the message of our culture is often shouting it's all about you it's all about gain it's all about you know, building our kingdoms. And yet, to live this way is to be opposed to the self-sacrificial love of God. Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, everything you could get in this life, and yet lose or forfeit their very self because we have chosen not to follow Jesus on the path of self-denial to the cross. Jesus says that following him means not living for ourselves. This puts like a nail in the head of this idea that there is faith over here and discipleship over here. They're the same thing. That as we trust in Jesus, we must follow him. We immediately start following him. It's an enormously high calling. When Jesus calls a person, he calls them to self-denial. He calls them to die to self. A specific thrust of this passage is we die to self in the area of rejection. Jesus was rejected by those who should accept him. And in verse 26, he says, do not be ashamed. It seems as though we might gain much by denying Jesus. We may even gain the whole world. And yet the path Jesus calls us on to is instead to stand firm to him, to live for him and for others at the cost of our very selves. That's the way of the cross that Jesus calls us to. And we see it's exactly the same path that he took. The Messiah who demands our allegiance calls us to the same mission as he had to give ourselves for others according to the will of God. That's a high calling, but of course, it's not self-denial for its own 
sake. Instead, as we follow Jesus on that path, what is prepared for us is eternal glory. And so Jesus calls us on the path towards glory. See, we gain by losing. We may lose, but ultimately we gain. Radical self-denial is done in the pursuit of the glory of Christ. Verse 26, the Son of Man is coming back in his glory and the glory of the Father and the glory of the angels. And when he returns, we will either share in his glory or we won't. Jesus here talks again about being ashamed and not being ashamed. Shame often makes us feel like we have something to apologise for. As if following Jesus was something that we should sweep under the carpet. But why would that be the case? Look at what we have for us. We have nothing to hide. We gain our very lives as we cling close to Christ. With the light of his glory on the horizon. Well then, what do we lose by losing ourselves? No, we gain our very lives forever. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says that Jesus walked the path of the cross, fixated on the joy that would be his. We walk the same path as Jesus, that same joy will be ours. It's that famous Jim Elliot quote, he is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Because the path of the cross is the path towards glory and eternal joy, we are not fools. As we follow Jesus, we are not foolish. Instead, Christians are the only people who are clinging on to that what, which they can keep. And so that is what helps us live lives of radical self-denial. That is where we get encouragement because we know where we are headed. Verse 27 just gives a little snapshot of that for the disciples. They're gonna see the transfiguration, which again is a taster of the resurrection that beats even death. There is glory coming. As we deny ourselves, often in the most painful ways, we do it knowing that is not in vain but instead, that is the path that Jesus calls us to on the road to glory. As we come towards the end, this is a really hard thing. And in a funny way, it feels even harder in lockdown where we are naturally just trying to get by. Where family life and relationships and work just claw at us. But again, also in lockdown, it shows that the perspective of living only for here is so limited that nothing in this world is going to last. And so we're called to deny ourselves. Living in light of the glory that is to come. Maybe that will encourage you today. We have glory coming. And so those moments of denying ourselves now as we follow Jesus are not wasted. The little things we do in the cross-shaped life, they really matter. It is following after our King who has saved us. It's done following the Messiah who gave up everything in love for others. Maybe that encourages you, maybe that spurs you on to live the cross-shaped life this week. Coming back to the foundations is challenging, isn't it? It's always important for us to check that we haven't drifted off course. But we're crystal clear. We're following Jesus' path. His identity demands we follow. His mission has guaranteed forgiveness and joy for us. And so we live for Jesus on the path of the cross and follow him into glory. 
Let me say a prayer for us as we finish. Father, there is so much here that is challenging to us and encouraging. It's impossible to do justice to these words truly. But I pray, Lord, that we would all, who are listening, be clear on who Jesus is, on why he came, and his call upon our lives to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Amen. Thank you so much for um, watching and listening. If you've got any questions, please get in touch using the link below the Grace Church website. Um, have a blessed week and go and serve the Lord. Enjoy. <laughs>